I am making this video because the current situation just makes me really mad. To sum up the situation, let me ask you this question. Would you trade your Lamborghini for, let's say, like a Toyota? Because this is sort of what has been happening with people that try to learn the Karokan, they make it just fine out of the opening, but then they feel kind of like lost or a bit confused in the middle game. It is pretty much like you own a Lamborghini and you're just gonna be trading it with a different car because you don't know how to open the door vertically. And then go ahead and be like, oh, I'm just gonna get a Toyota and I'm gonna play a different opening. When in fact, all you need to know is learn how to open the goddamn car. So in today's video, we're gonna be discussing exactly about the most common middle game positions that you probably have a hard time uh, making progress with. Enjoy. All right, everybody, getting another black game, one and go Z4. We're gonna be playing the rock solid car Khan and uh, let's see what kind, kind of variation are we gonna face. Because still in this rating range, I would be expecting a lot of the advance we actually get uh, to see the classical, which is pretty interesting. Now, knight c3 would be the most popular way of getting the classical variation, simply defending the pawn. However, I want you to not get confused if they are starting with knight e2. That is pretty much going to be the uh, same thing. You just take and we transpose. So knight c3 already important to go d e4 first and then knight f6. Because a lot of people would be making the mistake of playing knight f6 immediately which allows e5 and then your knight does not have a good square. Additionally, if you are already more experienced and you're looking for an interesting sideline, I already uh, talked about a6 in, uh, in a different video. Um, so yeah, we're going to be sticking with the main move, just taking, and then uh, here you have a choice between developing the bishop, which is the more solid and also a bit more drawish variation, or what I really love to play here, knight to f6. Leading to one of the most fascinating pawn structure uh, in chess, if he takes, he's not forced to take, but they will take most of the times. Uh, and after pawn takes, black has pretty nice easy play, bishop d6 castle, uh, usually we're waiting for the knight to go to f3 and then uh, we pin, rook goes to e8, knight d7, knight f8, and then we like to set up the battery with bishop c7, queen d6 and play against his king. Uh, he does none of that, so he just plays knight to g3, which is a common way to deviate. I would say you're gonna face this around like maybe one out of four games, so it's actually very important that we get to uh, deal with it here. And people have generally uh, mixed recommendations on knight to g3 because you can pretty much do anything. Usually beginners try to just play bishop g4, which is okay, but it can be pretty annoying if they are playing f3. Because you have like no retreating square since the knight covers both and that can get you in uh, in trouble. I'm not a huge fan of e6 because that's locking the bishop. Computer says it's fine but not to my taste. h5 is a strong move but yet again I feel like it can lead to strange positions. So in my opinion the easiest thing that you can do as a beginner against this is just fiancaro. Alright, we're not gonna fiancaro very often in the car or Khan. This is actually quite a rare situation but you have to understand that the fianchero is specifically very effective here because this pawn really uh kind of restricts the knight so makes the knight passive and uh, the bishop has easy development and we're ready to break with c5 and lengthening the diagonal of this bishop now he plays bishop uh, there which is um you know not the most principled Usually in this structure, white tends to uh, develop kingside first and get castled, then move the bishop. So we started in a way like the opposite way, you know, like let's say when you wake up in the morning and you're getting dressed, it's like you put your uh, pants first and then your underwear on top of your pants. That's what it feels like he's doing. But he combines it with queen 2 which is an indicator that he may be willing to long castle which I guess it's a thing. Uh, it is not something theoretical, so I would be assuming that it's not great. I haven't seen this very often, I've gotta be honest. And I have a few moves that I'm considering. Like I could be prophylactic going queen d5, saying we are setting up a little bait because castle blunders the pawn. But I think uh, castling ourselves is also not bad either. I can start by targeting the bishop just because he developed it very early. 
So I move like h6, bishop f4, knight d5. Targeting that piece. And in case of bishop e5, I kind of don't want to give him the bishop trade, but I'm not sure if we can get away with playing uh, something ugly like f6. Yeah, I really don't like that. <laughs> that looks pretty gross. But I'm going to do h6. I think it's important to start with that. He cannot go back because we're winning a piece. And if he goes bishop to uh, e3, then knight d5 wins the bishop pair, which is nice. And when he voluntarily gives up the bishop pair, we're very happy. Now, we have a choice between taking with a bishop and taking with a pawn. I'm going to take it with a pawn just because uh, we are Tartak over boys or girls. Uh, and I think despite the bishop being on a bit of a like exotic square, since usually bishop is there, this is still very interesting. And precisely these knights can just keep be getting, uh, you know, hammered by these pawns. So I really like our potential here. I'm going to start with castle. Idea of rook 8 and he still goes long. Okay, this is interesting. I think important to start with bishop e6, gaining a tempo. Mm, I'm not sure that we're actually threatening to uh, take that because he can play b3 after and the bishop is trapped in jail. But yeah, I may be really willing to play something like queen d5 and increase the pressure. A pretty important uh, key idea that uh, you are having in the Tartakor structure when he is castling long. Normally, your pawns are placed like this. So if you can get your pawns like that, and then queen d5, he has no way to defend. Because if you play queen d5 now, it's kind of useless. Like, he has b3, among other things. Just killing two of your pieces with a single pawn move. But if you have your pawn on a4, let's say, already, and you have b5, so that you're also stopping c4, queen d5 is devastating. No kind of play. Important idea, eye-opening. If you cannot get an attack against uh, Queenside Castle, this is probably why. Uh, so still we need to be a bit careful with the move order. So knight e7 would be tempting. Finishing development, I could do b5 as well. Uh, is he gonna ever like use this? I can maybe play queen, I, queen d5 as an idea, but then c4. Okay, I think I'm just gonna go b5. And knight e4 is a mistake perhaps because of this. He can get away. Knight e4 actually we have a different move that's, uh, that's winning. So if he plays it, uh, we're going to pause for a bit. But on 94, you can pause the video and try to find it. Because, uh, yeah, there is going to be bishop takes on a2. After king takes, you have nice little check, and then you win the knight. That's h4, which is a move that's honestly not really that concerning. Because h5, there is g5. And this still makes me wonder, can we just follow up with our plan? I can also just play h5, you know. H5, G5, the only potential issue is if he can set up like a uh, bind on the light squares. I don't really see that happening, but I'm going to play H5 anyways, just for safety measures. And we are uh, once and for all stopping his attack even before it starts. So expecting a move like Bishop D3 now, just because what else can he really do? And then I'm going to be playing A5. Another idea is knight d7, knight b6. The knight stays great there. It's all about like really controlling c4 and d5 in this structure. Uh, I'm not going to rush with knight d7, knight b6 just because he may try an idea like that. And I want to have the knight kind of covering the square just in case. So I'm still pretty much really uh, eyeballing this idea. Getting the pawn to a4 and then uh, queen d5. Or maybe just a5 and then queen d5. Because even if he plays b3... If I can use a4 to open up the file, I think that gives us uh, enough fuel for the attack. So uh, I may very well just use it. Okay, moment of truth. Should we go queen d5 or should we play a4? Okay, he has this maybe because bishop is undefended. So I'm going to start with rook e8. I can do queen d5. Huh. Tough spot. I'm just going to do queen d5. It's a tempo move and we're also defending. So I'm going to do queen d5, forcing b3, because uh, a3 allows me to infiltrate anyways. Notice that uh, b5 stops him from uh, kicking away the queen with c4, and on b3 the point was a4. Idea to take. Bishop e4 targeting the queen, which is a respectable move, but I'm going to do queen d6. I think it's important 
just keeping an eye on uh, maybe playing queen a3. One potential idea for him to try to liquidate is d5, but I don't think he'll be in time because uh, ab looks very scary. We can even sacrifice the piece, and I think with the queen coming there, you have no idea how critical like this move is to keep the queen ready for the attack. And even maybe sacrifice the bishop sometimes. Or, you know, if he's like not going to act quick, I would say uh, even something like a slow playing would be fine. Like bishop d5 or maybe knight d7, knight b6. Getting a knight to d5, then taking, then maybe just double up rooks on the e-file. But yeah, he plays d5 and now I wanted to sacrifice. He's going to go de and then I wanted rook a2. No, actually, I didn't want that. De, that is going to be a blunder because the queen opens up. So de, we have uh, like even uh, b8 because f5, then in case king is in the corner, we had that. Takes with the pawn. I'm just going to go simple move. Pawn takes. Now, after bishop takes, I can trade. I can move my queen. We're just going to be taking, and then I don't want the queen trade. So I'm going to go all the way to a3, attacking and also defending. And now, you know, the bishop <laughs> has been kind of uh, sleeping the whole game, but uh, when the bishop opens up with a move like f5, it can easily be the end of the game. So I don't think we even need that. I can just easily get my knight to b4. Notice that the rook is defended by the other rook. So queen no longer covers it, but that's not an issue. And yeah, knight b4. Once again, really, these knights are completely pointless because of these pawns. These pawns are so nicely defending our king. It just makes uh, my opponent's life impossible in getting any compensation. Okay, I mean, cannot be a bad thing to bring the other rook with tempo. Gonna do the knight next. Already may have ideas to sacrifice and already our sort of strong play forced the blunder. And in order to like not fully lose the queen, he has to do that. But it's still, we're gonna have an extra rook. So he just uh, missed the fact that the pawn is pinned. Oh, he actually finds it. That's a good find by him. But uh, yeah, not gonna save uh, anything. <laughs> it like... Uh, Got the queen, but not more than that. He's still down the rook, and uh, more so the king is about to get made it because finally uh, the bishop's gonna open up. So f5. <laughs> Look at this. King b1, rook d1 is made. Pretty hilarious. You can play knight e5 to survive a bit longer, but uh, he actually does. How do we uh, immediately end this? I don't know, could just trade or play rook c5 because on f4 then the knight uh, drops. Yeah, I think rook c5 is very precise. This is, okay, final touch of the game. He just resigned, so. Uh, okay, curious about some things. So first of all, uh, we should really check that little idea. I have to say, by the way, opponent, has played really, really well for his elo. Like, some of you guys even said it in like the previous video, but I think we get to face some of the best 900s and 1000s. <laughs> he played like so many good moves, like d5 was a good move. And I think really critical queen d6 here. I'm curious to check it with the engine, whether queen d6 is top line, yeah. You see, by a high uh, margin, queen d6 is best. I think in this position, very critical idea. So queen to d6, uh, in order to go ab and then queen a3. And after d5, I think sacrifice is very strong. If he takes the piece, there is this idea. And if king in the corner, there is f5. So this has to be deadly. Okay. Uh, um, no matter like uh, how he blocks, like let's say c3. <laughs> that at least you have bishop c3 has to go there and you like take the bishop then take one of the rooks easily winning and uh yeah if he plays like 94 whatever he can at least take this piece and still he has these issues on the long diagonal so he went cb pretty quickly just took that and yeah he just completely passed it 
I'm curious what uh, score are we gonna get for this game. I would say it's over a 90 easily, but I could go, I could be wrong, and yeah, apparently we got a 91. So game was solid. I just wanted to go over this because it looked to be a little bit of like a mess. But I promise, key takeaway, you got Tartacore structure, okay? You just look at the pawns, and if he goes long side, these are the key ideas. So, you're playing bishop e6, and before you rush to anything like queen d5 that allows c4 or b3, the game changer is to have your pawns placed on the light squares, like this. Simply because whenever you are doing it, notice how, uh, okay, here I just did it because I wanted to rush, but to give an example, uh, see, this was bad because of bishop g6, that's why I didn't play it. Uh, but let's just say he does nothing. Just the final picture that you want to remember. When you are playing queen d5, he just has no moves. Okay, like c4 you take, and b3 you take and you open up the rook and you clearly have big attack. So, I changed the move order a little here just to gain some speed and a4. Still, he has no way to avoid this uh, opening of the a file. And then, uh, yeah, queen d6. Nice final touch. It is not usually going to be uh, so important whether you have this or not. But here it was nice because he was threatening to open up the position. So, um, yeah, I think that's pretty much all you need to remember about this structure. I'm super glad that we got to show how to kill uh, knight g3 with g6. And also we got to talk about some important plans of the uh, tile cover pawn structure. So, with that being said, I think we can move on to the... Following game. Alright, everybody managed to find another black game. I'm gonna be sticking with uh, our beloved opening and uh, we get very principled uh, play so far. First two moves, still in the book, in 1000 ELO games. Can you believe it? I'm gonna be playing d5. And let's see what variation are they uh, gonna play for. And we see the knight on c3. What does that mean? Okay, the knight on c3 is the introduction for the classical variation, where it is very important that uh, you remember to take on e4 first, because you want to be playing the Tartakower. What do I mean by uh, you want to be playing the Tartakower? You want to be answering knight captures with knight f6, which is a very kind of strange looking move uh, in a way that it allows uh, the double pawns. Because you know, if you think about how the history of this variation really developed, Everybody played bishop to f5 kind of almost exclusively at the beginning. And then Anatoly Karpov came with a different idea. And he said, uh, okay, how about we try knight d7? Preparing knight f6 and then you can retake with a knight. And you no longer get double pawns. But the fact of the matter is how chess developed nowadays. They even realize that, dude, you don't need to play the Karpov variation. You can just play knight f6 immediately. And one of the main reasons for that, uh, I believe, is, uh, well, the fact that after they take, remember, we are always uh, gonna castle short. Fine, some people even consider going long castle in this structure as black. It is a bit unnecessary. It can be interesting, for instance, like Vladislav Artemiev, who is one of the best players in the world and has main the Karukhan. Sometimes goes for that, but he's like really doing a lot of um, more advanced things. So, uh, you know, in general, you're going to be always castling short. And just look at how nice of a cocoon we're going to get for our king. How are you even going to get mated when we are playing such thing? It's impossible, I swear. Just going to go bishop to d6. And uh, before we dive into more details of these and as the game uh, will progress, I want you to clearly understand that, uh, you know, we're playing the Karo Khan usually just to be sort of solid and uh, have a nice little counter-attacking opening. Well, I want you to clearly understand that here we're going to be going for blood. Because on one hand, we have this very nice cocoon for our king. But the main downside of it is that, uh, well, white just has a 4 against 3 majority on the queen side. Meaning, pretty much all the end games are going to be suffering if not lost. 
In fact, twice. Let's say dream scenario would be to trade every single one of the pieces, get into a king and pawn endgame, and that is just instant loss for black because you're just down a pawn on the queen side. So to compensate for that, we need to uh, go for dynamic play. And that is usually attacking the enemy king. So it is not very often that we're going for the king in the car. Okay, only when you have this nice cocoon, we need to go for the king. And I'll show you how. First, we started with bishop g4, just pinning. So once we get castled, uh, then we pin. Typical beginner mistake uh, to, let's say, rush with a pin like this. Because uh, let's say... It allows moves like queen e2 that are annoying and uh, a number of reasons. So make sure to get castle first, then you pin. He plays queen to d3, which queen to d3 is a strange move, but he is saying, okay, I want to unpin. All right. Uh, I can play rook to e8 or knight d7. I would really like to play a move like rook e8, trying to already uh, occupy the file. But rook to e8 makes me wonder, can he play queen b3, which is a double attack? I don't think that should be something to be afraid of. So I think we're going to start with it. And let's see. I decided to go for bishop to g4 because this is really the universal plan. And uh, if you are like below 1800, 2000, I think you can play this uh, every single time against uh, no matter what white does. Here he goes for a setup with bishop c4. He can also play with bishop d3 or bishop e2. Once again, stick with the same strategy and uh, you should be okay. One nice little detail about this structure uh, and uh, an option that you have if you are feeling fine. I tried bishop g4, I kind of like it, but the bishop on c4 is a bit annoying. Well, I want to let you know about the option of uh, playing knight a6. Okay, it is something that works specifically against bishop to c4 in this pawn structure. So you can really shut that down. By playing knight a6, no need to be afraid of takes because this is going to give you good dynamics with the b file and the bishop pair. And knight a6, knight c7 prepares bishop e6 so that you can take back with the knight. And that is very solid. It's just bulletproof. Okay, I played rook 8 and my opponent just went knight h4, which is a bit of a strange move playing onto the edge of the board. I think we can just continue development with knight a7. In case of a move such as knight f5, uh, it wouldn't be a disaster to even take. Okay, we just have to adapt. He's playing something strange. I have to be honest, I don't really know the theory here. And I have to be honest, I even missed a winning move. Hello? What winning move did I miss? In fact, even nicer, he plays h3. Forcing me to go for the win. I was just like so zoomed on the idea of focusing on development uh, in the opening. But now you get to see why uh, rook to 8 was so uh, beneficial to begin with. And it's a very strange tactic because his queen is in a weird position. And you have bishop to eat too. Just pretty much immediately, we managed to infiltrate and uh, pick up the material. So, uh, well, we didn't even get to show the typical, you know, knight f8, bishop c7, queen d6. Put the queen in front of the bishop, then go for the mate type of ideas that are very typical for the uh, pawn structure that we are playing. The so-called tartar cover. But okay, when we are just, you know... We play some basic opening and then we wake up in a winning position. That is not uh, a disaster, I would say. So he goes for takes, which is interesting try. Uh, I guess he's going to go for check. Taking on h7, I don't think it's going to give him enough uh, play for the attack. But what do I know? Maybe we're going to get made it. <laughs> uh, queen to b3, I think. King f8 is very safe and the attack is over. I think ultimately he should try that move. I think taking on h7 should be the best uh, practical move. But on the other hand, I just noticed uh, a very nice uh, move that's going to dodge uh, the attack. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be pretty much his attack is going to go back like a boomerang after the move uh, that, okay, even you can try to pause the video and find it, but it's defending and attacking in the same time. So. A lot of people would just uh, be going greedy here, saying, okay, I'm going to take Rook and let's hope I don't get mated. Even that may be fine, but you're losing a little bit of the control of the game. So control is a lot of the times uh, more important than uh, picking up uh, another few points of material. So we start Knight of 8 A lot of people tend to forget about this move in the Tartakawa. 
And uh, we are just hitting the queen. I do believe the queen has to go back and then uh, we're going to be happy to take the rook. And this knight of eight move is very important because it's also stopping the queen from going to g6. So multi-purpose move. And how is he really going to, you know, follow up the initiative? I don't see a move. What is he going to come up with? I am expecting queen to f5. Queen to h8 would just feel kind of going a little bit too deep. You know, I don't feel like... Uh, Crawling down that cave onto the a8 square is gonna <laughs> take you very far. Just playing queen a8 give me, gives me a feeling of claustrophobia here. Oh, it plays queen to g8. What do I know? And then resigns. This has been a hilarious outcome of the game. Um, he was like losing anyways. The main point is that if he goes queen h5, where do you think we should uh, move our king to be safe? Should we go uh, here? Trying to hide? Or should we go over to g8? And this is, of course, a trick question. I'm just testing your attention to see if you spot the bishop, okay? If you are new to the channel, allow me to introduce you to a very premium feature of your pieces. Not only knights, but also bishops move backwards. So you can take that queen. And uh, yeah, that's why he had no moves. He had to play queen f5, and then I'm happy to like trade his rook and... We are up a clean piece, okay? Uh, what do you want me to do next? Do you want me to like log in into your account and play? Uh, that's all the help you're gonna get. So, jokes aside, uh, if he would have played the more standard move like h3, I want you to remember that whenever you are playing the uh, Tartar cover structure, we meet h3 with bishop to h5, okay? Only instance when we are taking the knight is when he is forced to get through in structure. Because then his king is going to be very weak. Uh, let's say you can just uh, maneuver your knight around. You can set up the battery and uh, it's going to be vulnerable to checkmate. So, uh, yeah, unless that's a thing, always slide it back uh, in this pawn structure. Uh, and okay, typical uh, potential way for the game to follow up is something like this. You go knight f8, important move, just making sure that you are not going to get mated and the knight could potentially maneuver after. And the key idea to remember in this position is that we want to get the queen in front of the bishop because uh, since we have a uh, worse pawn structure, we want to be generating a dynamic play against the uh, enemy king to compensate for that. So, uh, yeah, remember that. And uh, I think with this, uh, we can just move on to the following game. All right, everybody managed to find another black game, this time facing uh, 1100 rated opponent. Going knight f3, so perhaps this is something that you really want to keep in mind. They play knight f3 and do the second move quite often, which is not the most principal thing to do by any means. And they usually combine it either with... Uh, advance or what we have in this game with taking so in theory if you are starting knight f3 uh, you are supposed to either play the two knights or to go for the more uh, topical move d3 this is very kind of meta at the top level nowadays for some reason they just uh, somehow discover that the upcoming end game is pretty tricky to play it is obviously like fine for black but uh, yeah I wouldn't really recommend you enter that against uh, somebody stronger than you uh, because it is really trickier than it looks. So he goes for exchange uh, instead, just going to be taking with a pawn. So yeah, usually um, yeah, maybe knight e5 could be a thing if you are playing this move order with the main point being that after knight 6 there is bishop to b5. On knight e5, however, I have a very simple uh, fix. I like to just play a6, staying. No need for any bishop to b5, taking control of that square, and this very easy way to equality for black. Uh, this is what I recommend in my course. So instead he plays d4, which is uh, what I expect most of your opponents to play. Then the rest is pretty simple. Knights onto the natural squares, bishop g4 uh, if possible. If he plays h3, we prefer f5, because just need to keep that active bishop. He goes there, and yeah, I'm gonna go for the pin. Pretty important to start with the pin, but knight f6, knight e5, bishop d7 is okay for black as well. 
I just like to start with the pin here. And we're gonna be having an interesting position if he plays a3, because that's gonna allow me to introduce you to another pretty nice rule. Or in case you're already watching the channel for a bit, I have uh, yeah showed this in the past, but some people still don't get it, which is, you know, a bit surprising, but uh, we'll make sure that by the end of the video, we're gonna have a clear idea of when to take or not to take on f3. Plays knight b2d2. I have to say, opponent's playing pretty well for his elo. Uh, yeah, like this moves. His last two moves made a lot of sense. I'm just gonna do e6. I'm pretty much just playing the easiest way possible. Like, if I wanna be uh, really precise, I could change some things. Uh, okay, now he plays h3. Time to watch out. Because if you slide it back, g4, bishop g6, and then knight e5 is annoying. Why is this annoying? Because the knight on c6 is pinned. So the main factor is the bishop on b5. So whenever they either have bishop onto b5, or let's say this knight develops to c3, it's easiest to remember it this way, we're going to be answering h3 with bishop takes on f3. So just takes, and... Because he went for all these kind of uh, rodeo with the knight, how do you think we are supposed to develop the bishop? We can play bishop e7, that's what I normally recommend, that's the easiest, but knight e5 is a bit annoying. So bishop e7, knight e5 is a bit annoying, therefore maybe bishop d6 is stronger. So that after knight e5 we can take it, and if bishop d6 they take, we take with the queen, that's fine. And you know, the queen defends uh, the knight and no more uh, problem with this bishop pinning. However, if you just wanna never bother with a pin anymore, you can play the move queen a5. That is just winning a piece. How did this happen? Well, normally this is not winning, but we have a little idea that um, can be seen sometimes, which is Knight d2 all the way to f3, meaning he no longer has knight c3 to defend. So that just wins you the game. Knight moves, that's it. Extra piece. Should be pretty easy uh, after. So normally, like uh, if he had knight c3 as a defense, I wouldn't have gone for this check. I would have uh, simply played, let's say, bishop d6 to exchange. Even bishop e7 is not like such a terrible move. You always have rook c8 or queen b6 to defend. But uh, I tricked you a little bit there. I was talking about the bishop, but this shouldn't uh, mean that you're not considering tactics. Okay, like tactics are really underrated. Just, you know, even considering the small thing such as a check or stuff like that. Um, I'm not saying to obsess over tactics, especially in the Karo Khan, which is... Just a pretty non-tactical opening, but he always want to double check. I'm not sure what bishop c7 was meant to do. I think he's just trying to say that my queen is not going to be able to return home, but I don't know what is this guy smoking. So I'm just going to take on c3. Maybe play rook c8 anytime if I want to uh, kick that bishop. That is a thing. Or, you know, I can just do this. For now, I'm just making sure my queen is kind of safe because rook b1, rook takes on b7 would have been a little bit annoying. But, um, yeah, I think, uh, well, he's going for it. We know he's going for it. Can we defend? A move like b6 would be a big mistake, just because it weakens the knight and uh, rook c1 he can take. I'm not a huge fan of the way I play this, I'm going to be uh, really honest, but I think I can just play a move like bishop b4 and uh, stopping rook b7, making room for castling, rook c1, I can move the queen anywhere. So, yeah, I think easiest to avoid any counterplay play would have been on bishop to c7 just to play rook c8. And, like, not even to take. Easiest would have been to finish development, but uh, but okay, that's whatever. I think this is also fine. Uh, rook b3, so I don't really have many squares for the queen. Instead, uh, I mean, in fact, I only have one, which is c4. But then, yeah, any moves like this, we can easily trade. Targeting the bishop, so this is... I would say, quite likely to get played. 
um, if it takes to the pawn. I can play a move like this, allowing EF, and then uh, I can try to bring the bishop back. I mean, <laughs> position kind of complicates for no reason. I could also just play 97 or 94, even rather more active. Do I want to go active? I don't think it changes much, but let's go active. Um, this is a thing. Ready to castle on the next move. So yeah, just going to pick up the bishop. I can try to keep my own bishop, but I'm just going to go for a very simple play. Now get castled finally. And we have a strong knight in the middle. Two extra pawns. I'm just going to offer queen trade. You know, this is the very first thing that we are doing whenever we have the extra material. Queen trade. Okay. I don't really care how good you think you are. That is just how you should be treating these positions. Guys, you, you even got to see Magnus against Prague in the World Cup. Like, he won the first game in the tiebreak. And then what is he doing with the white pieces? Do you think he's going to go for, like, anything spectacular? Like trying to, I don't know, humiliate Prague or something like that? No, he. if you want to play like a pro... You do exactly what Magnus did. He played the Alapin, which is really known to be the safest way to deal with a Sicilian. And more so, it just means he was trying to force a draw. And it really worked. Move 20 in the game. <laughs> Prague had no chance to like even keep the game going. And I'm not saying this with like any intent to uh, trash talk Prague on that. He obviously played like great event, but I'm just trying to tell you that even Magnus would be very cautious with everything that he does, no matter how big of a genius he really is. So maybe that's a sign. You should play a little bit safer when you are ahead in material. So rook to e4, just happy to trade again. Notice that I'm always like blackmailing him. So if he doesn't trade, I'm winning this. So he's just like forcing him to do a lot of like really unpleasant things. So I'm going to take, you know, you remember like when you used to go to school and in order to play some video games, you had to finish your homework first. It is the same here. <laughs> We're going to force him to do that else. Yeah. He either trades or he's not going to play video games. If that makes any sense. So just going to be taking. And take that again. Really exchanging all the pawns. Generally, how you're going to be winning most of your games. Uh, I don't really imagine it as being uh, in the middle game. Or if you win in the middle game, that's good for you. But a lot of these situations, when you are having a small edge, you win a pawn, then you trade all the pieces. When he has only one king left, I mean, he cannot have two kings, but when he has the... <laughs> King alone, he's, you know, defenseless. So, uh, yeah. Key takeaway from this video, uh, I mean, from this game only, when you are playing the Karukan and you're dealing with the exchange variation, so, meaning they are playing d4, uh, okay, this would be like more standard way to get the exchange, but the way you're going to face exchange could either be knight c3, and then take, knight f3, and then take, or he'll billy attack, and then take. What do these variations all have in common? When they take, it's exchange variation. So, in the exchange variation, when your opponent has either uh, bishop on b5, or knight on c3, so this would work the same if the position is like this, we like to take on f3. So... Remember that, you can even write it down, and that's going to give you the optimal way on how you want to be dealing with uh, the h3 move. So, this was pretty simple. So, normally, notice that queen a5 here, he has knight c3 defending. While after we do this, like the way it happened in the game, this knight transferred all the way to f3, so it can no longer defend. And we are just winning a piece. So, he had to throw in the move. Bishop takes if he wanted to take with a knight. And we would have gotten a normal game. But hopefully uh, you're going to keep in mind this tactic because it is a very common mistake. It is so common that I remember even in like an older video, 
I had this position as black and I was not paying attention. And I think I just developed. And somebody highlighted in the comments that I had the check. So pay attention to that. And with this being said, I think we can just move on to the following game. Okay, getting another black game. Are we gonna be getting another advance? Opponent starting knight f3. So usually from my experience, this is a sign of either the two knights or he is gonna be taking. But he also has the option to push, which would be just getting it uh, back into the advance variation territory. And there is no question about it. Here we have it. Showing once again what is so why it is actually like so vital to really understand what you're doing in this type of positions because just being uh, you know down uh, with space a little it can just be you know a big turn off for a lot of the newer players that are just trying to pick up this opening. Now you have a choice between a number of moves. I would say three equally good moves, which are. Bishop g4, c5, and bishop to f5, okay? Now, the tricky part about bishop to f5 in this position is that, uh, well, it is what most people finally decide to play, from my experience. But remember, against the advance, ideally, you just want to be getting the bishop in. So why on earth would you voluntarily just place that bishop on the f5? So, personally, I just like to start bishop g4. This is what I recommend. Nothing wrong with c5. I just feel like c5 is kind of scaring them away from playing d4 a little. I want to play them, I want them to play d4 so I can undermine their center. If that makes any sense, I just feel like if they get the center, it is easier for us to attack them. Um, and after bishop g4, d4, okay, now uh, I'm just going to be playing e6. Okay, there is no need to rush whatsoever with c5 here. Because we already managed to get the bishop out. So just e6 here. Typical mistake, bishop g5. You pause the video and uh, try to find the winning move for black. Yes, winning. I know most of you guys would play uh, bishop to e7 like a coward. And just exchange and get an okay game. But instead you can just start attacking like a chicken. Okay. So bishop to g5, the killer move instantly, bishop takes on f3. We enter down this path of, uh, you know, they take our queen, we take their queen. He takes on d1, we take on d8, and during this whole kind of, uh, you know, elaborated process, we just end up with an extra piece. How nice, I know. This is why you're watching uh, the channel in the first place. So, he... Finally, just place bishop to d3. Now, you still want to remember the main goal is to play c5. Even though you can get away with developing moves like that, this is not really our plan. Our plan is just to play c5 and knight to c6. We just want to have the spawn structure. We just want to be very straightforward about our intentions, okay? We just want to put pressure on d4. So we start by developing the knight. Still, whenever he plays the bishop move, this tactic is available. So anytime... He may just blunder. I'm not saying necessarily that he will, but it would actually be funny for the video to to wait. Okay, now just for you guys to show how often this can happen is, I may just allow it because I think best move objectively is to take and then play knight g7. But I'm gonna be making a nice little useful waiting move. I'm just gonna be playing a6 and. I can bet my house with you, okay? I don't own a house, but I'm gonna bet my inexistent house with you that sooner or later, he is gonna be making that blunder. Please be three. I may have just lost my inexistent house with that, but there is still hope. I'm gonna do rook c8. Now, chances is that he's gonna play just bishop b2, which is actually a smart thing to do protecting his pawn from d4, but I'm still curious. I have played so many games that uh, I just know they really want to develop the bishop there, but okay, this opponent actually just plays it to e3, which is 
yeah, surprisingly okay. However, all the moves that I have just made uh, are very useful moves to have. I just kind of delayed my development a little bit. Uh, so now I can play knight e7, but maybe dc5 is a little bit annoying. We do have knight takes on e5, uh, exploiting the pin over the knight, regaining the pawn immediately. But for simplicity's sake, uh, it may be better to just take and avoid any further transformation. I think it's nice to take also because we pretty much know what we're paying for, okay? We are just fixing that weakness on d4. He's going to be taking back with a pawn unless e5 becomes very weak and uh, then we just need to finish development. How do we finish development? Well, first of all, you want to avoid typical mistake for this type of positions, which would be bishop to e7. People be just playing bishop to e7 in situations like this, and then they're like, huh, how am I going to develop this knight? I don't get it. Yes, because you need to think before you move. It is for such professional advice that uh, we are going very well together. <laughs> so first, you want to do the knight. Bishop can wait, okay? Wanna do the knight first so that uh, your knight is not gonna be crying at the end of the day. So knight goes to f5, ideally. Why to f5? Because whenever you're dealing with the advanced variation, uh, the main uh, target, the main battlefield is the d4 square. So we prefer knight f5, but notice that it's very important on bishop takes, we can take back with the bishop. I would never play knight f5 if he can double up my pawns. So we just do knight f5. I think. And I'm gonna play it. Now on h3, we always take on f3 against the advance. So we have a bunch of rules against uh, any independent variation that they play against our Karukan. So whether it's exchange or uh, classical, aka the Tartakower, the rule is gonna be slightly different. But against the advance, you can write this down Every single time it's going to be a good move to take on f3 in this type of situations. And, uh, okay. Bishop to g5. Remember I said in the beginning that this is a common blunder? Here, opponent is like a little bit lucky that on bishop takes on f3, he does have knight capture, saving the piece. So I just pretty much just, um, you know, play bishop to e7. Getting the trade. Preparing castling and still answering h3 with capture. Then I need to, however, watch out for the knight. Because I don't want to get the double pawns, you know. You guys know uh, I have uh, this kind of... Uh, what is it like when you are afraid to, let's say, hop on a plane? Or like, not hop on a plane, literally, but fly. I have something that's, you know, giving me anxiety when I need to get double pawns. <laughs> So I just like to stay away from that. Hopefully by now you do too. Uh, else you will learn from personal painful experiences that I already had. So you don't need to go through that. I promise. We're in this together. So uh, I'm just preparing to castle. He decided to take on f5, which is somewhat odd. I guess he was just primarily uh, kind of concerned about the d4 pawn. And for really good reasons, though, because literally every single one of our pieces are just fighting towards the square. So three guys literally ganged up on this pawn, c5 earlier in the game. You pretty much just get to see what the power of uh, yeah, getting your pieces to work together for one goal is uh, in chess. Just incredibly effective. Queen to c1. Huh. Queen to c1, that is asking for trouble. Notice that my rook is undefended, however, so I cannot go for any sexy stuff. So I'm gonna need to protect my rook first. And then he needs to watch out, okay? It is very important to immediately sidestep, okay? If white is to play, just get the queen out of there. You really want to get into the habit of whenever you have this battle with, you know, like queen and rook. It's like, imagine you're walking on the street and you see a gang of people holding baseball bats. You know? You're not gonna just go past them thinking, Oh, maybe these are some professional baseball players. Dude, what, what if they start beating the crap out of you, No, know? You see a gang of people like that? No, you just walk the opposite way. Because it's gonna happen exactly like in this game. We just win a pawn because of the discovery and, you know, his queen is gonna be now a constant target. 
I'm just going to go for trade because we already have the extra points, so we prioritize the exchanges and then, you know, we have an open file. What do we do with open file? Literally, just double up the rooks. That is the only open file. It, this is how, you know, the rooks are going to be effective. Rooks and open files are like the fish in the water. Not wet, but feeling well. So, rook to c3 may be happening next. He attacks my bishop. I'm just going to be a simple man. I'm just going to go bishop back. G4, by the way, uh, you know, it's like you're feeling good for one second, but it's that kind of move that you may be regretting uh, later on. It, uh, it's kind of like, uh, you know, drunk texting your ex. You feel like, oh, maybe what if she responds and uh, we get some interesting interaction. And then, you know, like the second day you realize that you're just making fun of yourself or I don't know. <laughs> you kind of get where I'm going with this. It is definitely not something that I would do, of course. So, uh, targeting this, bringing my queen. I'm telling you, this is the embarrassment, okay? Like, she or he opens up that text, doesn't even reply. You're just left completely vulnerable. King is gonna be weak for the rest of the game. I may even go this far and uh, play a hilarious checkmate. Wow, this is actually pretty funny, if we are able to get it. Guys, this may be one of the nicest combinations that we have ever played on the channel. And I'm not exaggerating, I think maybe even a move like this would work, however, Queen e2 is kind of spoiling it. Imagine in the previous position, rook g3 takes king h1, rook c2. I don't think he would have had counter play. And on queen e2 we have simple move. Just pretty much winning instantly because if the queen moves that just allows simple mate on h2 we don't even have to you know sacrifice things and all of these is happening because of the drunk text man you know it's i don't I imagine you're in a relationship already and you drunk text your ex it backfires so badly that your ex gets in touch with your actual girlfriend and then they both break up with you it's maybe uh, you can go this far and say that i'm, I'm kind of overthinking this but I'm the one that's delivering checkmate right now, so you get the point. Hopefully. Uh, anyways. Uh, now, to really clarify what I've uh, obsessed over uh, in the opening, when I play this cheekiness with a6 is, like, a lot of your opponents are just gonna go bishop to g5. Okay, now, let's test your attention. Do you even remember what the best move was because don't tell me you're still playing bishop to e7 because we really need to talk okay bishop e7 yes you're gonna get like an okay game and still win but why don't you just want to go for the uh complete refutation bishop takes on f3 if he takes that is just a hanging piece waiting for you to be taken if bishop d8 trade queens Voila, I let you do the math. We got three minors. They only have two. So three wins. And besides that, just remember, I think key takeaway to remember, uh, knight goes towards f5 and do not start with the bishop because then your knight is going to be kind of trapped in its own stable without any food or any place to sleep in. However, I heard horses sleep kind of like standing, but I don't know if that's actually true. So, uh, knight e7, knight f5, bishop g5. Uh, yeah, this time was no longer winning because uh, he had this, but uh, simple move, get developed. And, uh, you know, you're going to be winning a lot of these 1000 ELO games just because of the fact that opponents are not respecting fundamentals, okay? You see the gang of people holding baseball bats, you just step away. He just, oh, yeah. Just some nice people there. I'm just going to be hanging around. Yes, but then you get hit in the face. Knight takes on e5. Notice that you cannot take the knight because of the threat against the queen. And then black is just winning. We won the pawn. Rest is simple. So with that being said, I think we can move on to the following game. Thanks a lot for making it this far into the video. You have no idea how much I appreciate you to the bottom of my heart in case you want to learn more about this beautiful opening 
please feel free to check out the playlist that we have about Ikaro Khan. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you around. Take care.